Hello, I'm Lynn Johnson, an Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, or OCVN, and today I'm going to be leading you on a virtual hike at the prairie at E. Milo Beck Park in Springboro. The pictures shown in this virtual hike were taken in the middle of April of 2020. Uh, I've been a volunteer naturalist for a number of years at uh, several places, but in 19, 2019, I became an Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist, or OCBN, and later that year, I began doing some volunteer programs, uh, in particular nature-themed hikes in the parks uh, for the Springboro Park Board and the city of Springboro. This year, because of the coronavirus, the scheduled hikes were canceled. So I decided to put together this virtual hike so you would have a chance to see some of the features of our parks, uh, even though you might not be able to get out there and join a program. Milo Beck Park is located um, in uh, Springboro at the intersection of South Pioneer Boulevard and Lower Springboro Road. This kiosk shows an overview of the park. The close-up map shows the details of where things are here in the park. The parking area is right here. Uh, we're going to start out on this hike, well, before I do that, this area that I'm running my cursor over with the dots on it is the prairie portion of this park. Uh, along the west side, you can, well, you can see Clear Creek here running uh, along the creek and of uh, the park. And this west side of the park has uh, trees and water uh, areas uh, called a riparian corridor. We'll cover that in a separate program. There's an overview and picnic area uh, right here at the top. And there's quite a little ridge right along here. Uh, it drops down about 60 or 70 feet from up there to down to the flat area where the prairie is. But our path for this hike is going to start out here at the parking lot, come down through this little bit of woods, and then along the east edge of the park, uh, or of the prairie, which also is the east edge of the park, down through here. Then we'll kind of cut across at an angle across the southern part of the prairie and end down here. And as I said, I'll have another hike going back up through the riparian corridor in a separate program. So let's proceed now to start, get our hike underway. Uh, here's uh, a view from the parking lot just to show you where we're getting started. Uh, we take this path that was between a couple of those pine trees back there start down toward the prairie. But before we get down to the prairie, we find the first sign of uh, animal life or an animal activity in the prairie. This is maybe not the most pleasant thing to look at, but it is an important part of the life in a wild space. Here we find a bunch of feathers on the ground. Uh, these feathers appear to be, they're all black, they appear to be from some kind of a blackbird, probably a red wing blackbird because there's a lot of those in the park and this bird was apparently attacked and probably killed and eaten by something that was likely a cooper's hawk. Anyway getting on with our prairie here's an overview of the prairie from the northeast corner of the prairie looking in a generally south or southwest direction. Uh, here's another direct view just slightly to the left of the previous view. We're going to be looking at the, the life of the prairie because prairies are all about life. Uh, a lot of the things we'll be looking at will be plants, but there are there's much animal activity out here as well. This is a little tree swallow who's checking out one of the bird boxes along the edge of the prairie. And back to this. Does this just look like a bunch of dead grass or weeds? Well, the tops of these things have died off. They grew last year. But when we take a close-up look, we see that things are growing in here. They're starting to pop up. Uh, here we have, it looks like plantain and red clover growing up through the dried remains of the tops of last year's plants. 
Here's another one. This is teasel. Uh, this plant is interesting in that it takes two years to grow. The first year it grows a bunch of low broad leaves similar to what you see here and in the second year up pops the seed head. Uh, these are dried seed heads from last year and then the plant uh, produces seeds and dies. The, this plant is not a native plant, but it is commonly found in prairies in this area. This was actually one of the first cash crops introduced into Ohio. The uh, pioneers who moved into Ohio in the early 1800s brought this plant in and, and raised it and sold these seed heads, which are quite stiff and quite bristly uh, as a, uh, for use as a comb for combing out felt. But we're going to go on and see what kinds of interesting things we can find here in the park. Here's another blackbird, again, probably a red-winged blackbird, but the red doesn't show in this image. Here's one of the reasons why it's really kind of important to leave those uh, dried seed, seed pods and, and plant material from the previous year because this is an important shelter and home for all kinds of animals over the winter. This is a goldenrod gall. The, it's turned sideways because the plant got knocked down over the winter. But the uh, plant uh, grows vertically. And then in the summer when the flowers start blooming on it, a small fly or wasp of some kind, I'm not sure exactly what kind of an insect it is, lays an egg in the, in the top of the plant, its larva hatches out of the egg and crawls down in the stem there and starts chewing on it. And just like our skin swells up when a mosquito bites it, this plant swells up in response to the chewing of that larva inside there and makes a nice snug little home for that guy. Uh, that larva stays there all winter and then in the spring burrows his way out. So if you find one with a nice little round hole like this, that uh, means that the insects survived the winter in there. Uh, if you find one with a much larger kind of cone-shaped hole that's a little bit ragged, then a downy woodpecker came along and said, aha, winter snack, and ate that little uh, larva that was inside there. Okay, we have one of our most common wildflowers, the dandelion. Again, not a native plant, but the insects and the rabbits and lots of other things do use this as a food source. More things growing. And here's one we'd rather not have growing in there, uh, but it is in there anyway. This is the invasive uh, honeysuckle plant. More growth. And what I'm going to comment on here in general with a few interruptions as we go along to point out particular things is that by leaving this uh, growth, there's a bird up in the tree, uh, a little hard to tell exactly what that one was. Um, golden Alexander's starting to bloom, not quite fully open yet. Uh, but why do we leave this stuff standing over the winter? Well, I mentioned the goldenrod galls, here's milkweed seed pods. Uh, those seed pods release their seeds over the winter. This provides a lot of cover for little birds like this. I think this is probably a field sparrow. Um, and it doesn't prevent the stuff from growing in the springtime, even though there's lots of uh, dead plant tops there, there's growth coming up through there. The rabbits just love that space uh, to be protected from the foxes and the coyotes and whatever other predators might be out here. Uh, if this was just mowed like the path here, that rabbit wouldn't have very much of a place to hide. But with all this tall grass, there's plenty of places for him to hide. There are some of those tree swallows flying around. There were a lot of them flying around there, most of them too quick for me to catch with the camera. This is a really fun plant. Uh, you can see here, I'm going to bring the cursor back into the picture uh, right here, that the stem on this plant has a very square cross section. Uh, and that stem can get to be quite tall, uh, six or eight or even 10 feet tall in the late summertime. The leaves grow completely around that stem and 
they kind of stick up a little bit as you can see the leaves growing here and water actually accumulates where those leaves come down to that stem and can stay in there and some insects and possibly even some tiny amphibians may uh, even breed in those little pools of water. This is called the cup plant, another swallow. Uh, here again you can see uh, some of the prairie. On the left is a little pond here that is actually more growth, um, a pond that has been used by beavers in the past. The beavers chewed off this tree. You can see that it's kind of weathered that was probably cut off several years ago. And the beavers are gone now. Uh, they chewed up all the bark on the little trees in the area and, and moved on because there really wasn't any food for them. But the point, the point here is the pond is private property uh, belonging to the homeowners association for those homes to the east of the park there. So when you visit the park, you can look at the pond, but don't go over there because it's not actually part of the park property. Uh, I think this was a song sparrow. The little dark spot on the on the breast tends to indicate that. Some kind of a little berry in there. If you look closely at the stem just above those berries, you can see some sharp little thorns on there. My plant books tend not to show the fruit. They show flowers and leaves and sometimes stems. Uh, so I didn't really make much of an attempt to try to figure out what kind of a plant this was. Red-winged blackbird. They love to be around the water. Uh, they will nest in the little willows like that or cattails or even out in the grassy parts of the prairie. There's one in some short grass where you can see the red bar on his wing. Another little brown bird. A nest up there in the top of the tree and that little white spot down at the lower uh, part of the picture to the left of center is a uh, gourd shaped uh, birdhouse made, made out of plastic. This is a wild grapevine. You can kind of tell that by the curlicue uh, tendrils there. And on the other side is just the very, very beginnings of the leaf starting to bud out for the year. More uh, insects on the dandelions. And if you look closely at that uh, bee, you can see the uh, pollen sticking on to some of the bristles there on its back. So, uh, oh, there's a eastern bluebird. This little tree, uh, I think it's probably it's a maple tree of some kind, probably a sugar maple. But notice that there's some growths there on the trunk. I'm going to get a little closer view of these growths. There you can see a fuzzy one and a kind of a flat one. The fuzzy one is, I think, in the family known as reindeer lichen. Um, I've got a book of lichens uh, from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And it shows a couple things similar to this, but not this particular one. But I think it said there were 70 some species of reindeer lichen in the state and it doesn't picture all of them. Uh, this is also a lichen. Uh, lichen is spelled L-I-C-H-E-N. And a lichen is a symbiosis of a, a fungus and an algae. The fungus provides structure and extracts nutrients from the substrate, either the trunk of the tree here, the bark, or uh, sometimes soil or rock, uh, and the algae provides uh, food from the sunlight through photosynthesis. Neither one of these, uh, in, in the case of the, the lichen, can live by itself. They require support from each other to survive. More little birds. And as we continue on, we find signs of burrows and uh, other things like this. Um, Here's another sign of life in the prairie. The, this is uh, technically known as scat. You may think of it as some other word that starts with S and ends with T, um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, scientists, a few of them anyway, actually study this stuff because it's quite interesting. You can find out a lot about what kind of critters are out there by looking at what they leave behind. Um, in this case, we can identify this by saying, ah, look, there's fur in there. 
Um, so we know that this was a carnivorous animal uh, that ate other animals that had fur. And from the size and shape and from uh, experience and from hearing from uh, biologists that have actually studied this, I can say that with a fair degree of confidence that this is coyote scat. Uh, it's about the same size and shape as what uh, a dog of similar size would leave behind, but most of our dog food doesn't have fur. So if it's got fur in it, it probably came from a coyote. So eh, continuing on, uh, the path running off to the left there is the nice mode path that the park maintains for people to walk on, but the animals aren't so particular. They make their own paths where they wanna go. Uh, this little path going off through uh, here is probably made by deer. Uh, I th think I saw some deer tracks in some of these places, but uh, was unable to photograph one right here at this point. Some of you may have recalled that in previous years, the city mowed all this stuff down uh, very, very short. Um, and there were some discussions at the park board early uh, in 2019 that pointed out the importance of having this area as cover. The reasons that mowing is necessary is because things like that honeysuckle and various kinds of trees will grow in there. If it didn't get mowed or something, uh, in a 15 or 20 years, this would be a scrubby forest. Uh, and in 50 years, it would look like the forest back there by the, pine, or by the, the river. A real prairie has several options. Uh, in the Great Plains, fire was a major uh, controller of trees and woody shrubs in prairies. Um, also, bison grazed that. Um, but when I talked to the uh, uh, park maintenance personnel last year, they said that they weren't real excited about having a herd of bison in the park. Not that they would mind the idea, but somehow they didn't think that that would go over real well and city regulations prevent open burning. So mowing is the option that we have for keeping those plants out of there. But we're going to try over the next couple of years mowing uh, more like late winter, early spring and not mowing the entire park each year. Uh, this will save a little bit of time and money for the park maintenance people uh, and probably give the prairie uh, a better uh, lease on life as uh, it provides good over winter cover for all kinds of animals. That bird flying around up there was a red-tailed hawk. I found this little piece of bone along the trail. Not enough of it to identify what kind of a bone it was, but something had been out there eating. Uh, here's some hair. Looks like it probably was from a possum. Uh, this is the southern end of the park, and off to the east there, you can see where the developer is preparing that area uh, for addition of some houses. That area is not part of the park where the trucks and, and the dirt is there. But if you notice that that's raised up about three or four feet from the level of the prairie. Technically, a good bit of the prairie is in the floodplain of the Clear Creek. So I suspect that the builder had to, or the developer had to raise that land up to avoid having to deal with uh, flood insurance and things like that. Uh, earlier this year, I took a class called the Tree Commission Academy from the Ohio Division of Forestry. And one of the things that we learned in that class was that heavily compacted soils, like they pack that down to make sure it doesn't sag and drift and, and uh, flow away over there, is not a good place to plant trees. So we'll have to watch and see whether the developer uh, knows how to amend the soil to make it uh, so that the trees that they plant there after they build houses uh, can survive for more than just a few years. And we're finishing up our hike through the Milo Beck Prairie with another view of a, an eastern blue bird. This is the bird that these bird houses were actually put out there for, and there are quite a few of them using this in the prairie. So you can see that this Milo Beck Prairie has indeed uh, a lot of life 
and a lot of things to look at and view and learn about down there. So thank you for joining me on my uh, virtual hike through the prairie at E. Milo Beck Park.